You were frozen with fear when it came from space. You were terrorized when it came from the deep. Your skin crawled when it came from the dead. This time, it came from within. What will be unleashed as we open the hidden chamber? Hey, when I was a kid, um, I, there, we, everybody grew up in family. We had all kind of odd rules, and this might be an odd rule. And my kids are here, so I don't. It's going to be kind of weird to talk about this, but I wasn't allowed to say the word "darn" um, or "dern," as we said it. Um, I lived in Miami, and uh, and the reason I wasn't allowed to say that is because it sounded too much like something else, you know? And so um, we just weren't allowed to say that because if you got too close to something bad, then that was bad. So as, as may have been true in your home, we kind of made a rule to keep us from breaking a rule. You ever seen that happen? Um, in fact, if you read the New Testament, there's tons of that in the New Testament. So it's kind of a biblical thing we had going on in our home there. Um, and so we weren't allowed to say that, and, and yet all my friends said it. So it was kind of like hard not to say it because I heard everybody say it, kind of like your kids, hard for them to say stuff. Anyway, so one day, and, and we lived in Miami, so this meant I was in the fourth grade or younger. So this is an, er, one of my earliest memories I'm sharing with you today. We had lived in, a, in Miami in a little tiny house with a very flat front yard with, a, with a, um, a sidewalk that went from the front door straight out to the sidewalk, and then equal amounts of yard on each side of the sidewalk, you got the picture, which was great because everybody played football in my front yard because we had a 50-yard line that was the driveway, which is great unless you got tackled on the 50-yard line. Um, but anyway, my particular memory was we were playing with our bicycles. I had a red bicycle I'm going back now, way back, and I, there was a kid in front of me, and for some reason he wouldn't move, and I shouted out to the top of my lungs, get that darn bicycle out of my way. <clears throat> and moms can hear things through walls, you know? I mean, my mom wasn't even outside. My dad was out of town doing something. And all of a sudden, I look up, because I'm facing the house and this happened, and there stands my mom on the front porch. And she says, Andy, could you please come here for a moment? You know? Now, how did she hear that? Anyway, so I went in the house, and, um, oh, oh, and I skipped one big part of this story. Okay, let me go back. When my parents had the conversation about you can't say darn, they said if I ever said it again, because I kept saying it, unfortunately, um, they said if you, say any, if you say it again, we're going to wash your mouth out with soap. That was like the big deterrent. So unfortunately, my dad had sort of made that threat, and then he had gone out of town and had forgotten to explain to my mom how that was done. And so... She wants to be a good mom and, and follow through and, you know, make sure what was threatened happens. You're not a threatening, repeating parent because you don't want to do that. So my dad's out of town. My mom's got me in the house, and she realizes now she has to follow through with my dad's threat. He's not there and never gave her, like, here's how, here's the manual on how you wash somebody's mouth out with soap. I mean, how do you do that anyway? So, and this is now, she, she told me all this later when, I, when we grew up, when I grew up. So she takes me in the bathroom, and I remember this part. And so she, I remember we're standing there, and she doesn't know exactly what to do, but something has to happen because there's been a threat and it can't be an idle threat and so she told me later she said I stood there in the, in the bathroom with you and I can still remember the little green lime green tiles in the bathroom this old house and um, she said I stood there looking at the soap thinking how do I do this and at the same time she said I was trying to maintain this sort of mad anger you shouldn't do that at the same time I go, what am I going to do so she did the only thing she needed to do she took my toothbrush and she wet it, and she scrubbed it, scrubbed it, scrubbed it in a bar of soap, okay? And maybe this is how you're supposed to do it. She was just making it up. Scrub it in the bar of soap, and then open my mouth, and she just, in, you know, went about brushing my teeth intensely with the toothpaste, uh, with a toothbrush, you know, f full of soap. And, um, and until today, in front of all of you, that was the last time I said the word darn. And I even had a hard time saying it now as an adult. Now, um... <laughs> That was my earliest one. Then there was another kind of similar thing where I had a play bow and arrow, you know, with the little red stopper on the end that could stick on glass or a wall, and, and I shot my sister in the living room with that. And I kept saying, I thought it was a deer. I promise, I thought she was a deer. And they didn't buy that. And, and, and the punishment for that was my dad took the arrow and tried, was gonna spank me with the arrow, you know? And, and, and um, but I was a negotiator, you know, some of the kids are like negotiating, but dad, you know, so I'm negotiating through the house. It ended up being a chase scene through the house. 
And it ended up, this, I mean, this, this stuff happens to you all the time. I know, you're kids, you remember this stuff. This isn't unique to me. And, and I ended up in their, their bathroom with a little, they had like pink little three-inch tiles, you know how that was? And I ended up in the bathroom, and I'm still negotiating. And in one last attempt to negotiate my way out of this um, spanking, I sat down on the toilet to, so he couldn't spank me, but it was open. <laughs> so with my footy pajamas and all, I went in. And I was stuck there. So anyway, I, I tell you those stories um, because I thought they were kind of interesting. Um, no, I, I tell you those stories because for me, those are, and you have these too, those are my first, those are my earliest memories of behavior modification as a child, as a kid growing up. That as a kid, I learned, as you did too, I learned there's just certain things you don't do because there are consequences. And, and you only have to be, you know, you only have to have your mouth washed out so one good time to realize, okay, I'm not going to say that anymore. I don't know if there's some big moral law about you should not say that word, but in the world of family, that's, that's not a good thing. You don't shoot your sister with a bow and arrow. You just, over time, we, we learn things based on behavior modification that things just don't work out for us in the real world if we say certain things. Things don't work out for us in the real world if we do certain things. And then as we get older, we learn what you have to say, you know, to get through school, and you learn what you have to do, you know, to get through life, and you learn what to say to get a date, and you learn what to say to keep a date, and you learn what you do and don't do on a date, then you learn what to say and do to, like, keep a relationship going, and, and you learn what to say and do to have a job interview, and then you learn what you can say and you can't say and you can do and you can't do to keep a job, and you learn, you, we kind of, you know, navigate through life learning what to do and learning what to say in order to kind of make life work, and then every once in a while, something happens you know, to us, and we say something we didn't mean to say, or we do something, and we're like, I don't know where that came from, and suddenly a relationship crashes, or we lose a job, or there's a lawsuit, and, you know, we look in the mirror and go, whoa, where did that come from? Boy, I better not do that again, and, and again, we all have developed a filter through which to filter our words and to filter our actions in order to make life work, because if you, if you don't have a filter, you know, you get your mouth washed out with soap every day. You know, if you don't have a filter, I would have been spanked every day. But we develop this filter of words and behavior so that we can function in life and maintain relationships and make a living and, you know, handle our money and, and all that kind of stuff. And so basically, we learn real early on to monitor our behavior. But that's not enough. Because at some point along the way, as I said, something kind of, if you notice this happens, something kind of comes through the filter. You go, oh, God, I didn't mean to say, where, where did that come from? Or all of a sudden, you, you, you do something and it's major consequences, or you hope you don't get caught, or you hope nobody finds out, and you go, oh, you say something like this, oh, that wasn't like me. Or somebody might even say to you, what, what were you doing? That wasn't like you. And it's as, if, it's as if your filter had a hole in it temporarily, and you patch that filter up, and you go, boy, I better never say that again, and I better never do that again. And, and what we're going to talk about for the next few weeks is that it's really not enough, especially as we get older, it's really not enough to monitor our behavior, that we have to learn to monitor something else. And that something else we have to learn to monitor is something no one has taught us how to monitor. In fact, because we grew up in a world that focuses so, uh, so much on what we say and what we do, we tend to neglect this other thing, this source from which is we're going to see all of life emanates. Um, a few years ago, when we were actually we were doing a series here called God and Your Bod, um, I, I, we were talking different parts of the body, and, and, and in that study, I, I read some verses that I want to read you in just a minute. I read some verses that I'd read before. You know how this is if you, if you read the Bible, you read things, and then two years later, you read it again, and it's like, oh, you know, I didn't know that was there. And, and sure enough, it was there. You just weren't ready for it, or you missed it, or you didn't understand it. I, I, re I read some verses, and this, this was my initial thought, kind of since I'm on the confession kick here. My initial thought was um, either Jesus really didn't know what he was talking about, or there's something here I don't understand. And since I make a living assuming Jesus knew what he was talking about, I decided to opt for maybe there's something here I don't understand. You know how that goes? You go, that can't be true. Well, I get, well maybe I should give it a second shot. It is in the Bible, you know? Then you go back and go, wow, it's true. It's not intuitive. I don't understand it on the surface, but maybe it's true. And in these verses, and I'm not going to tell you the whole story surrounding these verses, because actually Jesus was having a conversation with some religious leaders. And in the middle of this conversation, it's amazing. He just kind of throws out this verse, this, this idea, this thought. And it, it's not even that much a part of the conversation. He's having to talk about one other thing. And he just kind of goes, by the way, blah, 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 blah. And it's like when I read that, I'm like, whoa, that's huge. And then a few minutes later, he kind of throws another thought in that direction. And you put these two thoughts together, and it, it, it's somewhat of a, a shift. It, it's somewhat of a new idea. And again, it's not intuitive. And when I read you these verses, you may find yourself pushing back going, I don't know about that. 
So for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about it because I think as many of us know as we get older, and some of you who are younger will discover later, maybe this will be a heads up, it's just not enough to monitor your words, and it's not enough to monitor your behavior. There's a deeper issue. It's that issue that causes some of you, once you got married, you said to your best friend or you said to your parents, you know what, he's not the man I married. I'm telling you, when we dated, he was this. Six weeks into our marriage, he was this. He changed overnight. I don't know who this guy is. I don't know who this woman is. It's as if, boom, it's like they're just, they're Jekyll and Hyde. They're like two different people. And you know, for, you know, he behaved right or she behaved right. He said all the right things. She said all the right things. And then who is this person? Because eventually we learn, either the easy way or the hard way, that simply monitoring our behavior, monitoring our words, it's just not enough. Let me, let me read you this first part of these, these verses. This is amazing. This is from Matthew chapter 15. Jesus is in the middle of a conversation, and in the middle of the conversation, he drops this line. And I'm just going to give you the one statement. I'm not even going to give you a full sentence. You can look it up later, but here, here's what he said. He said, the things, the things that come out of the mouth come from the what? From the heart. And when you read that, you go, what? what, what, what? He goes, yeah. And, and, and you read the whole passage. Everything he says that comes out of the mouth comes from the heart. He said it's as if the mouth is like a stethoscope to the heart. If you want to know what's in a person's heart, you just listen to what comes out of their mouth. And you can figure out what's in a person's heart by just listening to what comes out of their mouth. In other words, in those moments in time where we go, oh, I didn't mean to say that. I don't know where that come from. Jesus would say, I do. Your heart. Oh, no, 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 Jesus, see, that was so uncharacteristic of the things I normally say. I, yeah, I know, because you've learned, you have a filter. You've learned to get along. You've learned to maintain relationships. You've learned to monitor and edit your words. But every once in a while, your heart is going to pierce your filtering system. And something's going to come out of your mouth. And it is evidence of what is in your heart. And you'll apologize, and I'll apologize, and I'll say I'm sorry, and I will make the decision. We've all done this. We'll decide, I'm never going to say that again. I'm going to double my efforts to filter what I say. And Jesus says, no, you need to listen. Because that's what's in your heart. That's what lurks within that dark place you've never learned to monitor. And what lurks there unmonitored and what lurks there undiscovered will eventually make its way into all of your relationships. Because eventually your filter is going to break down. And eventually something's going to happen in life. And something's going to come out of you and you're going to want to convince the world around you that this is uncharacteristic of me. And in fact, he'll say, no, 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 no. It's a reflection of what's in your heart. You, you know why this is a big warning for those of you who are engaged or those of you who are dating? And he's so wonderful and she's so wonderful. But every once in a while, whoa, where did that come from? His heart, her heart. All of a sudden, she just... Boom, she just let loose a tirade of words and it was so uncharacteristic in her heart, his heart. And when you marry him or marry her, he or she will bring his or her heart into the marriage. And in the context of marriage, the filtering system tends to get a little bit thinner. The efforts to monitor seem to, at times to wane. If you don't believe me, ask any married person. And if in those moments of engagement and dating, every once in a while there is this extreme, uncharacteristic barrage of words, I would bet you a lot there will be more of that in the future. Because Jesus would say, and again, if you don't believe it at first, we're going to spend some weeks talking about it. Jesus would say, that came from their heart. And they, like most of us, are men and women who grew up in a world where they were taught to monitor and edit their words, but never develop the skill, never develop the art of monitoring their heart. And Jesus goes on, and, he, and, he, and this is even harder to believe when you first read. He says this, for out of the heart, verse 19, it's the very next verse, 
For out of the heart come evil thoughts. To which we go, no, no, okay, now Jesus, I, okay, your thoughts don't come from your heart. Jesus says, yes, they do. No, 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 see, my thoughts come from my brain. Jesus says, no, your evil thoughts come from your heart. When you have evil thoughts, it's because there's something evil in your heart. Oh, yeah, but I, I have evil thoughts sometimes, and I just say, oh, I shouldn't think about that, and I monitor and edit and put a filter on my thinking. Jesus says, that's great. That came from your heart. You have an evil heart. Oh, 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 no, I don't have an evil heart. I'm a good person. My mama told me all my life, he's a good boy. <laughs> Jesus says, well, your mama was wrong. You're an evil boy. <laughs> you got a pretty sophisticated filter. But if you have constantly, if your mind is constantly filled with evil thoughts, thoughts that you never express, you have a heart problem. Look at this. He says, for out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder. Murder comes from my heart, absolutely. This isn't as difficult to see, is it? Every time there's a murder and every time we investigate and we dig around, we find that within that person that created that, that did that murder, oftentimes there's an issue. This is why whenever there's a murder, who do the police begin to interview immediately? Who? Family. Not strangers, family. That the vast majority of murders happened within the context of family or people that person knew. Why? Because there was some kind of relational thing, some kind of thing that had been out of shape. And inside the murderer, there was something stirring around. And it broke through the filter of thou shalt not murder. A filter that everybody comes into this world understanding and everybody agrees to. But something within their heart, Jesus would say, pierced the filter and they murdered because something was wrong in their heart. Murder, adultery, lust, sexual immorality, theft, which is simply greed, false testimony, slander, which is usually driven by jealousy. I wanna feel better about me, so I'm gonna tear you down. I wanna feel better about what I have, so I'm gonna criticize what you have. I wanna feel better about me, and when I'm around you, I don't feel as good about me, and the only way to make me feel better about me is to say something so that other people don't feel as good about you. And people say, you shouldn't say things like that. And you're going, you're right, you're right. I shouldn't say things like that. I gotta filter my mouth. And Jesus would say, no. You gotta to learn to monitor your heart. Because those words, aren't simply bad manners. Those words are a reflection of something going on in your heart. And, and if, you, if, you, if you wanna argue with this, again, there, there's so much evidence. Every once in a while, somebody will do a study and, and they'll ask people questions like, what would you do if you knew you could get away with it? Remember, have you ever heard of these things? Or you know, what would you do if you knew there were no consequences? And would you have an affair if you knew you never got caught and there's no consequences? Would you, would you murder someone if you knew you could do it and get away? Would you murder a stranger or kill a stranger if you knew you could do it and get away with it? All these kind of random out there questions. And every single time people do those studies, the percentage of people that come back and say, yes, they would do all kinds of things they know are wrong, all kinds of things they were taught not to do, if they knew there were no consequences and they could get away with it and there would be you know, nothing negative happen, would they do it? And the answer over and over for a vast percent, a huge percentage of people is always, yes, they would. You think, Ugh, what's that? Jesus would say, well, that's just heart. See, they've learned to filter and monitor their behavior. But there's stuff lurking around in their hearts that has gone unmonitored and undealt with and it continues to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And one day, in a weak moment, one day when the, when the filter's wearing thin, one day when they're just not as careful as they usually are, it's gonna come to the surface and it's gonna wreak havoc in the relationships that they care about the most. Now, and, and you know, we don't have to go out there and talk about they in some statistical world. It's your world. It's my world. It's those things you say and you think, where did that come from? Jesus say it's your heart. Why in the world did I do that? It's your heart. Why in the world would I say I'm against this, teach my children to be against it, and then go out and do it? What is that? Jesus say it's your heart. Why in the world do I, would, would I say I don't want to live in a world where that's even legal? I'm against it. If there was an amendment, I would vote. If there was a way to vote against and make that illegal, I would vote. 
<laughs> and then turn right around and do the very thing you're publicly against. What is that? Jesus would say, it's your heart. And until you learn to monitor, deal with your heart, your filter is just a filter. There's no real lasting permanent change. This is why the wisest man in the world, Solomon, and this is an amazing verse. I'm gonna, we, we might spend a few minutes today trying to memorize this verse because it's one of your cards. This is why the wisest man in the world who wrote so much, I mean, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, he wrote most of the Proverbs, and, and he was declared the wisest man in the world. People came from all over the place. He had insights on money, on business, on family, on relationships, on morality, on ethics, on poor people, rich people, poor people, rich people getting along, how to approach a king. I mean, this guy wrote on just about every subject imaginable and had insights that went you know, be far beyond the insights of anybody in his day and age, and he's still considered the wisest man who ever lived. Here's what he said on this subject. This is amazing. Proverbs 4, 23. Above all else. Check that out. In other words, I'm gonna say a lot of things. I'm gonna address a lot of issues. I'm gonna delve into a lot of complex kind of things. But above all else, if you don't read any of the rest of my writings, if you don't read any of the other Proverbs, if this is the only thing you ever hear me say, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Literally, it's where life comes from. You live from your heart. You love from your heart. You parent from your heart. You lead from your heart. You manage your money from your heart. You conduct relationships from your heart. He says that from your heart is the wellspring of life, that all of life, he just agrees with Jesus, your words, your actions, your attitudes, all of that stuff springs from your heart. And here's his command. Guard your heart. Guard your heart. And you know what the guard means? It means to be careful what goes in and to keep an eye on what comes out to be careful of what you allow into a place, to keep your eye on what's coming out. And, and, and Solomon, the wisest man in the world, says, okay, we're gonna talk about all the kind of practical stuff and all this doing stuff and saying stuff, but beyond all that, you've got to learn to guard. Stand guard over. Monitor your heart, because everything in your life emanates from this invisible, intangible thing that's not your brain, it's not simply your emotions, it's this, this kind of spiritual, it's kind of it's intangible. We, we can't find it if we cut you open, but you know it's in there. He says this, this thing that God put in us that the Bible refers to as your heart, he says you've got to learn to guard your heart, because all of life, comes from that. But let's face it, come on. No one's ever taught us to do that. We were just taught to behave. We were just taught to be good. We were just taught what not to say and what to say and what to do and what not to do. No one ever trained you and no one ever trained me specifically, Andy, you know, or whatever your name is, you know, here's how you guard your heart. Here's how you know when something bad is about to enter. Here's how to know that something, where something bad is coming from. Here's how you can tell that even though they ticked you off, they are not your issue, it's a heart issue. Here's, how to, here's some questions to ask of your heart. Nobody taught us to monitor our hearts. Nobody taught us to guard our hearts. We were just taught to edit our behavior. And yet the wisest man in the world said, above everything else, you've got to create and learn and develop the discipline of guarding your heart. There needs to be a little more self-awareness and you need to be sophisticated enough in your thinking to be able to push back from a difficult situation and go, okay, okay, okay. I know what they're saying. I know what they're doing. What's going on in here? What got in here that shouldn't be in here? What's coming out that lets me know there's some issue here? How do I monitor and guard my heart? So for the next few weeks, we're going to talk about that. The Solomon says it's above all else. You got to learn to do it. Jesus says everything you say, that's where it comes from, and everything that's negative that you've ever done comes from there. So we're gonna talk about monitoring our hearts because you know the truth is life, life, just life, it wasn't even your fault in many cases, life has a tendency of lodging stuff in our heart that has no business being there. And if you don't understand the disciplines and if we don't know the disciplines about how to clean out our heart, and I mean, you've prayed like I've prayed, God, you know, clean out my heart. Or there's an old song we used to sing, you know, cleanse my heart, oh God, and make it ever new, you know, you know, just, you know, God, I want you to do something in me. And that's certainly part of it. 
But the scripture goes deeper than that, and the scripture gives us some very, very, very specific behaviors, or I call them habits, habits of the heart, some very, very specific habits that if we will engage in daily, here's what will happen. God will use these things that he's instructed us to do to clean out our hearts, to help us keep our hearts clean, and to teach us to keep certain things at arm's length so they don't get lodged in our hearts to begin with. You see, this isn't new. This, I doubt anybody sitting here going, oh, what? Because you know what? Even though you don't know your heart all that well, possibly, you've met people, you live with people, maybe you raised some people, you used to be married to somebody, and you, 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 know, you, you would agree, you know what? There was just something wrong with them. I mean, there was just a, a twist, an evil, an issue, an edge. There was just a, a something, and they were so unaware of it. And anytime you tried to approach it or talk about it, they got so defensive. I've met people, you would say, who they had a heart issue. And, and I mean, you just, you just kind of lived around it. You could never talk about it because it was a lack of awareness. And it was always my fault. And they always blame, 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 blame. But there was just a thing they carried with them from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship. And so as we talk about this, some of you, and I understand this, are going to push back. Some of you are gonna find yourself saying things like, you know what, well, you know, if, if, if God will change my heart, then I'm all for having a you know, changed heart. Or some of you are gonna say, if she would ever change her heart, I would allow mine to be changed. If he would ever have a change of heart, then I could have a change of heart. But until he has a change of heart, I can't have a change of heart because the reason I'm so screwed up on the inside and the reason I have all these issues is because what was done to me, I'm a victim and you would tell us your sad story and we would all go, oh, if that had happened to me, I'd be screwed up too. So, you know, you just kind of hang on because I, you know, who, who, who wouldn't be messed up for, you know, as an adult if that hadn't happened to them? We would all agree with you. But here, here, here's the challenge. Will we take responsibility for our hearts? Will we learn to guard them? Will we learn to monitor them? Will we not push back, but instead embrace our responsibility to work alongside our Heavenly Father who cares so much about your heart. For some of us, it, it, it's, it's going to be some hard work, and you're going to say, well, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, Andy, but I don't do that because I have a bad heart. You know, I, I guess an example, there's some great verses in the Bible that talk about greed, you know, and, I, and this is a safe one to talk about because there's no one greedy here. I've never met anybody who said, I'm greedy. I've met people who say, I'm angry. I've met people who say, I'm guilty. I've met people who say, you know, I'm envious, but I've never met anybody who would say, you know, I'm greedy. Everybody just says, I'm careful. I'm not greedy, I'm careful. So let me talk about greed because that's a safe one because there's no greedy people here. You don't know if you are. The Bible says that the, that the way, this is sort of an example, that the way that you overcome greed is by giving. And so you say to a greedy person, look, you wanna get over your greedy heart? I do. I say, God, please take away my greedy heart. Give me a generous heart. And God says, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write a check. But I can't, I'm greedy. I, I, give, give me a generous heart and I'll act generous. God says, you want a generous heart? I do want a generous heart. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write a check, but I can't, I'm greedy. Give, God's going, look, I want to give you a generous heart. I, here's how you do it. You write a check. See, giving breaks the power of greed in your heart. But I'm greedy. See, I, that's the problem. See, this is, this, is where, this is the dynamic we're going to find ourselves in. It's like the guy that, that goes to the doctor, you know, and he gets a physical with a cardiologist, and the cardiologist says, you know, you're on the verge of major, major problems, but I think we can head it off without surgery. I'm going to put you on a strict, strict discipline exercise program and a diet, and if you'll stick with this diet, and if you'll stick with this exercise program, I think we can get your heart in shape. And, and the guy goes, but, but, but see, I can't exercise why? Because when I exercise, I get so tired so quick. And if I go on that diet, I'm going to be hungry all the time. Doctor, I need you to fix my heart. If you'll fix my heart, then I'll exercise. I see people who exercise. I envy them. I want to be like them. Fix my heart so I can exercise. The doctor says, no, 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 no. Exercise is how we fix your heart, but it makes me so tired and I sweat and I look so silly in those clothes because I'm so overweight. So please, fix my heart so that I will have this kind of appetite and so that I'll be more disciplined in my exercise. The doctor's going, I'm, I'm telling you how. You say, yeah, but I don't do that because see how it goes? In every one of these things, there is in you and there is in me a pushback to say, but that's just not how I am. And, and that, that, that's never been the way it is for me. 
And this is too hard for me. And I'm telling you, Andy, if, God, if I could pray a prayer and God would just reach down and change my heart, oh, I would be so happy about that. And I know my husband and wife have been praying that I'd have a changed heart forever. I know my kids have been praying. I've been praying that God would change my children's heart. I'm all for a change of heart. And as we open God's word together in these next few weeks and we gain insight into how that happens, there may be in you, as I know there are oftentimes is in me, a tendency to say, the reason I can't do that is because of what's in my heart. And God's going, yeah, but by doing that, I'll change your heart. And again, for some of you, you're going to look out into your world of circumstances and say, well, the reason I'm so twisted up on the inside, the reason I've got anger issues, the reason I kind of am on edge all the time is because of what was done to me. And we'll all agree. That's absolutely true. But God can set you free from that. One time, I only did this once because it's kind of insensitive and I'm not a very good counselor. I'm more of a consultant because I don't listen long enough. And I, I was with a, a couple and, and this lady was so angry. She just was so angry. And she had every reason to be angry. And her poor husband was, you know, he was kind of walking on eggshells all the time because he never knew who he was coming home to because she was, you know, just so much stuff. And she poured out her heart and told me about her family growing up. And she just had, her heart was so full of anger. And it broke my heart for him and for them. And, and I am um, I said, why don't we get your calendar out? I said, do you have like a Palm Pilot or something? And she had a little deal. I said, I want you to get your calendar out. And I said, I want you to mark a date and put down the date when, you're, when you think that you've allowed the first people that have hurt you to control your life long enough. Let's just pick a date. She went, what? I said, yeah. I said, obviously, you've decided to let all this hurt just kind of drive your life and your relationships. How long do you plan to do that? She looked at me like, and I knew what she was thinking. She was thinking, well, I don't have any choice, do I? See, I don't have any choice. See, things have happened to me that have impacted my heart, and I'm kind of stuck with this twisted, angry, you know, kind of dark heart that kind of, you know, sends all kinds of thoughts to my mind. And I said, well, how long do you plan to allow the people who have hurt you control you? How long? Have you put, is there a date in mind? Now, her husband knew exactly what I was talking about. And she looked at me like, you are the most insensitive person I've ever met in my life. So I never did that again. But my, my point was, <laughs> can't you see? Can't you see? You have made a decision. And I promise you, if I had said to her, as I would say to any of you, if I would have said to her, you know what? If you'll pray this prayer, your anger, your angry heart will be healed. She would have prayed it. If you push this button, if you memorize this verse, if you do these three things for a week, your angry heart would be healed. I, I believe she would have probably done it. But to do the difficult job, of learning to guard, monitor, clean out, and protect your heart, it's difficult. And the more damaged and wounded your heart is, the more difficult it is. And the more damaged and wounded your heart is, the more of a tendency you'll have, and I'll have to blame the people that damaged it and wounded it. But I would say to you, as I said to her, how, how, how long? A year? One more year? Six more months? Five more years? To the point where you're laying on your deathbed, and you call that person in, and say, before I die, I want to forgive you? How long? See, it's that simple. You go, well, see, that's, that's uncomfortable. I know, all of these exercises are uncomfortable. But the great news is this. God has given us, not simply a command to guard, but insight into how to do it. And these are lifelong habits. And you know what? Regardless of what's happened to you and regardless of where you are on this, even if it's for the sake of the next generation in your life, it's time that you learn to monitor and guard your heart. Years ago, when our kids were very young, and I don't know why I did this. This was just one of those God things, and I've shared this with some of you in the past, so excuse me while I, I repeat this. Um, one night I went in, I believe it was Andrew. He, I don't remember how old he was, but he was young, and I, he was laying in bed, and I just put my hand on his little heart, and I asked him this question. I said, is everything okay in your heart? He said, yes, sir, Dad. I said, okay. Next night, everything okay in your heart? Yes, sir, Dad. And as time went on, I began to do this with my children. I began to add some questions. I said, is everything okay in your heart? Yes, sir, Dad. Mad at anybody? No, sir, Dad. Anybody hurt your feelings today? No, sir, Dad. Anybody break a promise to you today? No, sir, Dad. And as I sat there, I thought, I so desperately want to teach my children to learn how to pay attention, not to simply what they do and what they say, but what's going on in here? Because I believe with all my heart from my own experience and from the scripture that we live from our heart and from our heart emanates all the issues of life. 
What an awesome thing to be able to teach the next generation to pay attention to something that nobody else in our culture or world will teach them to pay attention to. Now it's kind of a joke. Now I'll go in their room and say, is everything okay in your heart? Now they can rattle off the answers to the questions before I ask and we kind of laugh about it and that's okay. But I want my children and I want to learn and I want you to learn to be able to pay attention to what's going on in here because this drives, according to Jesus, your words, your actions, which means it ultimately drives all of your relationships. And the great news, and maybe this is new news, if you're, not, if you're new to Christianity or you're still trying to figure out, you know what this means? This is so awesome. See, maybe you thought Christianity was about behave. It's not about that. Maybe it's about being a Christian is acting like Christians. It's not about that. Your heavenly father said, I want to give you a new heart. I want to change you from the inside out. I don't want you to just have a really cool Christian filter for what you say and do. I want to do something more substantial than that. And I want you to work with me to learn to guard and monitor your heart. To stand guard over what gets in and to stand guard over watching what comes out. And when you notice those creepy little things that are growing in there, those little tiny dragons that are becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, monsters that are beginning to control your relationships and your thought life and all that stuff, I want to show you how to slay them and expose them to the light of truth and create in you a clean and a pure heart that will impact your words and your behavior. So I thought today as we uh, launch this series, I'd like to ask you a series of questions, kind of like this kid, the, the questions that I ask my kids a couple times a week. So would you do this with me? Would you just close your eyes and just answer these questions in your heart and then we'll let you go. Is everything okay in your heart? You mad at anybody? Are you waiting around for somebody to come to you to make things right? Have you had any extended imaginary conversations with anybody lately? Do things come out of your mouth on a regular basis that you have to apologize for, that embarrass you, that you wonder, where did that come from? Have you secretly celebrated someone's failure in the past several days? Have you secretly celebrated somebody's failure in the past several days? Got any secrets eating at you? Anything going on that you hope nobody discovers? Is there a question you hope no one ever asks you? Have you lied recently to somebody that you love? And with your eyes closed, would you say this prayer out loud? Heavenly Father, teach me to guard my heart, for it is the wellspring of life. One more time. Heavenly Father, teach me to guard my heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for this warning. Thank you so much for this reminder. Lord, many of us listening today, we know exactly what Jesus was talking about because we know there's just junk there and we don't want it to be there and we don't know what to do with it half the time. Would you please, 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 please teach us and teach us to teach our children to pay attention to this inner life this thing that you say is so important that maybe for years we've ignored. Father, teach us to guard our heart because we believe that it really is the wellspring, the source of all of our lives. Thank you for caring enough to tell us. Thank you for caring enough to tell us how. In Jesus' name, amen.